The Arts of the Theatre was a, a little ballet. It's about 12, 12 and a half minutes long, uh, set to um, the piano version of Ravel's Lavals. And it was choreographed by Ninette de Valois for a Sunshine charity matinee, which was put on at the Queen's Theatre in London, 8th of December, 1925. And she was asked, presumably, to pull this piece together by um, the editor of the Dancing Times, uh, PJS Richardson, who was the one who put on these charity matinees. And for de Valois, it was a wonderful opportunity. She had not since left uh, the Diaghilev Ballet Russe, she was planning for the opening of her school, which was called the Academy of Choreographic Art, the following March. And she called upon some of her friends and colleagues. And so there were five women, including herself, who took part in this um, performance. So it's a little ballet with a sort of grand title, The Arts of the Theatre. And one of de Valois' uh, primary concerns and interests at this time was the role of dancing within all of the theatre arts. And it was something that she'd come to think about very much during her time with Diaghilev. But it was something that was generally very much being thought about um, in the interwar period between the First and Second World Wars um, in Britain. And so she embodied the role of painting in her ballet. Um, Molly Lake uh, embodied the role of dancing. There was Ursula Morton as tragedy and Margaret Krask as comedy, and also de Valois friend, Dorothy Coxon, who embodied the role of music. The Arts of the Theatre, between 1925, when it was first performed by this rather starry cast, um, at one of PJS Richardson's Sunshine Matinees, was subsequently revived seven different times um, at the Abbey Theatre and at the Royal Court Theatre in London, all the way through to 1932. Uh, and although Morton took part in several revivals, for example, um, it was often used by de Valois subsequently as a kind of training tool for her students. So it was her academy senior students who tended to perform it in revivals. So you can just imagine that Morton uh, was constantly using her rehearsal notes, which is why they, they look so beaten about. I didn't recognise what they were at all. I passed over them. There is no label other than groups beats, steps, patterns drawn and clearly some floor patterns, quite complex counts, very precisely done, uh, repeat signs, so it's all very precise. The column of steps, uh, subtitled dance movement, is, is very e extensive. Comedy at the top of one page with a dance for presumably comedy written out. Um, three loping chassés to the right side, swing both arms in direction of travel, circle move of body, on, hands on stomach laughing with a lovely little picture, so very graphic. And then this page at last is labelled the arts of the theatre. Group opening, music starts, and it gives two groups and then it goes into the dance performed by music after the two opening groups. Turned over the page, painting, it was another of the roles. Again, painting is not notated. And then finally, the role of tragedy. Uh, very precisely um, notated all the way down the page until she exits, bring both arms over her head, across the back of the stage, run off right. I looked at the painting uh, and dancing pages, both of which were empty, and thought about it and thought, well, painting was performed by de Valois herself, so why would Ursula Morton have notated it? Because de Valois was always on hand. If they ever did a revival, she could just ask de Valois what they'd done. And um, dancing was performed by Molly Lake. I think there are several reasons that she didn't notate dancing. First of all, dancing, I think, is, is the most varied and longest of the solos. And it is conceivable that Ursula Morton simply didn't know it and thought, I'll, I'll ask Molly later and get it down later, hence the piece of paper is left blank. Um, or she might have just thought, Molly's going to be around if ever we revive it, so I'll, I'll just let her 
teacher said, which in fact is exactly what happened. So for example, when the school put it on, the Academy of Choreographic Art remounted the Arts of the Theatre in 1928 at the Royal Court Theatre in London, Molly Lake didn't re-perform it. She taught her part of dancing to Sheila McCarthy, who was a senior student at De Valois School. Um, but we know she was there because she was performing in other items on the programme. One of the important things to remember is, although we've got the notation um, for the choreography, we have absolutely no idea what um, de Valois' Arts of the Theatre Ballet looked like in terms of its design. So um, we're having to extrapolate. So the designer was Kathleen Dillon, who was a young Irish woman who had trained with Margaret Morris as a dancer. And Dillon ended up creating quite a few costumes for de Valois' very early ballets. We've taken ideas from what the very few examples we have of Dylan's costumes. So here's a lovely picture um, of Ninette de Valois wearing um, the costume for her own ballet, Beauty and the Beast. We have taken this costume with its off-the-shoulder, sort of rather Grecian tunic idea, its um, body stocking, coloured body stocking, cut off at the feet, and the sort of cheesecloth-y skirt and drape and single sleeve. So we've taken that idea, but we've very much changed the fabric into something much more diaphanous and silky. The sort of fabric that Pavlova was wearing in the mid-twenties. The Dylan design, and she did this for several of her designs, is sort of had applique decoration. Because we were going for the softer silk chiffon, applique would have been too heavy, so we've decided to go for painting but we didn't know what to paint on the designs. We have a, a fantastic scarf. This was given to the collections by somebody whose mother was an assistant in a photographer's studio in the mid-twenties in London and had always told her daughter Anna Pavlova came and did a photo shoot and left this scarf behind. It is this very distinctive deep pink colour um, with these lovely wave patterns. So we decided to, to pick up on these wave patterns. They're, they're quite delicate and they're kind of augmented with these little clusters of, of three dots in a, in a triangle pattern. Um, so I was very excited by, by those designs and looked through all of the Pavlova pictures that I could find and managed to identify it. This is Anna Pavlova's scarf that she wore in the Bacchanal, her famous Bacchanal, uh, with Mikhail Mordkin here in one of its later revivals. So we tried this lovely little delicate wave pattern on, on the silk, but it sort of came out looking like rickrack. It wasn't the modern feel that de Valois was aiming at, I feel, um, in her Arts of the Theatre Ballet. Right at the last minute, just as we were about to start painting the costumes, um, Richard Emerson, who's done a great deal of work on Margaret Morris and Morris's pupils, including Kath Kathleen Dillon, uh, managed to uncover this wonderful uh, design for me. Look at the wonderful, huge, bold wave um, borders at the end of these uh, beautiful gowns that um, Dylan designed and we thought Eureka we've got it yes we like the waves we're onto the right thing but they need to be big and bold but we're going to keep the little clusters of dots just to soften it um, and, and give it that sort of femininity and also there's a, there's a kind of feeling of, of, of boxed if you mix the big waves and the little dots you get a sort of dynamic contrast Um, here we have um, Ursula Morton again, the ever faithful Ursula Morton, always there as teacher, repetitor, um, leading dancer. Just, you know, her, her career very much reflects de Valois' own. Um, and this is a ballet called uh, The Fawn, made um, in 1928 by Ninette de Valois, a piece she'd been developing on and off for some time. What's interesting about this from our point of view is the costumes. So although they're not by Kathleen Dillon, they're by Rosalind Patrick. And Patrick was also trained, uh, she came out of the Margaret Morris stable that uh, Kathleen 
Dylan had come out of. And it is very interesting to see some of the same tropes, if you like, the design tropes. So that's the little footless tights here. They're, they're very gauzy ones. They're not made of um, stretchy fabric. They are sort of chiffony. And the little tunic, again, it's an off-the-shoulder tunic. And what we have taken from this is the idea of the gold belt. Our headscarves are going to pick up on the gold of these crowns. We, we weren't going to give our muses crowns. Uh, but you can see the line of Ursula Morton's headscarf, very, very 1920s, is, is what we're going to go for. There's an awful lot goes on in the 12, 12 and a half minutes of the ballet which is this very dense, complex score, uh, La Valse by um, Ravel, which of course, in 1925, when de Valois used it, she was the first choreographer to use Ravel's La Valse, as far as we know, uh, was very new. It was only completed in 1920. It, it had not, at that stage, been recorded on gramophone, and she would never have had the budget to pay for a whole orchestra. Um, and so it's very probable that um, she was using just the one piano um, version, which is um, the version that Ravel first produced anyway. It's very difficult to, to tally Morton's dancing counts up with my dancing counts, uh, or my dancers' dancing counts. The students found it very difficult as well. And Domenica Cardulo, who's been working with us as our pianist, also found it very difficult to make sense of Morton's dancing counts. But when it comes to the um, the little stick figures, the diagrams of the movement and groupings, and her description of the steps, no problem at all. She uses a very clear uh, blend of just straightforward right foot, left foot, uh, and classical terminology. Uh, she's extremely clear um, in, in her drawings and her descriptions. Um, there are gaps, so you follow what Morton says and then there's a stretch of music that it doesn't make sense with, so we've had to bridge those gaps. And I think it's simply that this was a first draft, probably in 1925, the original production, um, just made as an aid memoir and there were probably gaps and there are places in the score where she just does a line and that does in, indeed seem to indicate a, a gap. So we have had to bridge the gaps reusing some of the material that Morton gives us or going to other sources such as de Valois slightly later ballets, taking little pieces of, of movement from Nijinska, so Nijinska's Le Biche that de Valois had danced in only the previous year. What's interesting, I think, is the roles of, of comedy and tragedy, where de Valois looks at the two different sides of, of drama, narrative in dance. And it was something she remained very interested for the whole of her choreographic career in, in narrative, in telling a story. She did comedy ballets, she did very striking dramatic ballets like Checkmate, comedy ballets like um, The Prospect Before Us, for example, but also uh, the role of painting. It's so fascinating that she herself took on that role um, because all of her ballets really started from being inspired by, by the visual arts, by painting. So she went on to make great works um, like um, The Rake's Progress, which was inspired by um, Hogarth's series of paintings. But she was inspired by Rowlandson, she was inspired by um, William Blake, of course, when she made her ballet Job in 1931. And this goes on all the way through her career. So the subject matter of, of the arts of the theatre uh, was, was, was fascinating. It was her exploring what really mattered to her, dance's role in the theatre alongside the other arts. And of course, when she did open her school um, the following March, she actually had a theatre art section in which uh, design, theatre design, stage design was taught, there was a music library, history of dance was taught and uh, wonderful lessons in plastique as they were called, moulding the dancer's body to make new choreography and all of this of course resting as the title of the um, school says, the Academy of Choreographic Art upon a really academic classical technique. And very importantly, we are just five years away from marking the moment when the school will be 100 years old. And we will be marking the point where de Valois did open the school with 
Ursula Morton, Molly Lake, Margaret Krask, beside her as teachers, all members of the arts of the Theatre Ballet. Um, and as we look forward to that centenary, it is extremely important that we look back to the founding ethos, the founding purpose, the founding principles of the school. So the five-year journey ahead of us towards our centenary, I, I feel this is a wonderful way of, of kick-starting our consciousness about uh, looking back at this very informative period. Uh, Devawa herself was always somebody who, yes, look back, but only to learn from where you've come from. Looking back and understanding where you've come from is always so you can go forward, so you can do new things into the future. So in that spirit, uh, we're, we're reviving this ballet. And I think, I think you can see that spirit in three dimensions as it takes form. Um, and it'll be so interesting to see in costume, with the dancers performing their personality coming through as the original personalities would have come through um, the steps so that the whole thing all of these elements of the production suddenly come together and ignite to make theatre and won't that be wonderful to see what happens